is our last Welcome everybody. This is the last session of this series of webinars, Neuropelbiology Uncomplicated. Thank you so much for joining us for these five series of or five conferences that we've given online. Uh, we are the young boards of the International Society of Neuropelbiology. The talk today, I think the topic today, it's amazing. And I think uh, everybody is going to find really interesting. And I think the person that we pick to do this talk is the best one is Dr. Enrique Abrao. He's a fellow of Dr. Professor or Professor Postover, and she's doing the a PhD on neuropelviology and Lyon procedure. So, and he's going to talk about neuromodulation. So, Enrique, this. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation, Anna. I just share my screen. Here we have the presentation can you see the screen yes so let me put it down here it's a huge honor to be here it's a huge honor to uh to be with you guys to be with the the young board uh to be with the professor with professor posover who has been teaching me all his knowledge on uh, on neuropathology and also in line procedure and also this thematic that has caught all my attention and has absolutely taken my heart uh, since, of course, uh, before, but the beginning of the year when I started actually to do and to 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 join this world with uh, Professor Posover. And uh, the topic is neuromodulation. The topic is uh, the laparoscopic implantation of neuroprothesis, L-I-O-N, the LION procedure. And... Uh, this is, it's really, it's what I consider the most uh, definite uh, part of neuropaviology, the, the most technical part of neuropaviology, because this is what takes neuropaviology a, a little bit to the future, but it's also the present. And I will tell a story here. Uh, we'll divide it into, into chapters. And uh, for us to understand what is uh, neuro, uh, neuromodulation, what is the LAM procedure, and what's, why do we need this procedure, why do we, need, we, do we need this technique. But before, I would like to start with uh, the stop working. Hello. Sorry. Uh, before I would like to start with some technical introductions to do an overview, because here we are not talking anymore uh, about um, just uh, neuro uh, pelvic pain. We are not talking about uh, just um, problems only with nerves. We are talking also about spinal cord injury. We go way, way, way ahead in the indications and in our knowledge. And it's important to give some introductions about this knowledge. So when we talk about spinal cord injury, it's important. I, I like this study from Lancet Neurology in 2023. It shows us how many patients suffer from spinal cord injury. And we have the incidence in 2019 of almost 1 million new patients with spinal cord injuries. And also we have the the prevalence in uh in 2000 uh in 2019 we have the prevalence of uh 21 million patients up to 23 24 million patients around the world who suffer with uh, spinal cord injuries and who have this 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 problem and uh this spinal cord injuries it's something very complicated because the lamp procedure is a technique that has its costs, its costs, but it's also, if we stop to think about the costs of a spinal cord injury, we have this data from 2021 of a patients with cervical level injury that costs, that will have a cost of $1.13 million in the first year, followed by $200,000 of expenses in the following years it's just an introduction you will understand what i'm talking about in the in the the further on the, on the on the on the lecture but it's important to have these numbers in mind 
also something that we are not used to listening, we are not used to understanding a lot, it's the in gynecology and pelvic surgery, is the Asia classification. So Asia classification will give uh, the, it's a diagnosis from the neurosurgeons of the spinal cord injury, if it is complete or incomplete up to a normal. It goes where, from A to E, a being complete lesion, patient doesn't have any sensoric or motor function. B, it's sensoric incomplete, so it, the patient feels something, but not everything. C, it's motoric incomplete, the sensoric, the, the sensoric function is better, but the motoric function is not working very well. D, is motoric incomplete, but with a more, um, uh, with a further ability, for example, to walk, uh, but not with complete gait. And E is a normal uh, assessment of the spinal cord. Also, some other uh, technicality of the Lyon procedure is the chronic pelvic pain. And here we are talking about this data in JAMA. It's a huge journal also that gives us the number of 26% of the world's female population that suffers with chronic pelvic pain. And this is something we've been talking about in the last four webinars. And it's a huge problem because it's today it's uh, responsible for 40% of laparoscopies, 12% of hysterectomies in the US. And chronic pelvic pain is not gynecological in 80% of the patient. And we have in this other study showing those names, those labels that patients have a lot, pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, interstitial cystitis, painful bladder syndrome, and it all come with this chronic pelvic pain burden. And uh, we have a high cost in that. And here we are talking not the 1 million costs, but we are talking about 26% those percent of the female population. So patients with from one of uh, patients with uh, spy, with chronic pelvic pain will call will have a cost annually from thousand to seven thousand uh, dollars per woman per year. Come being able to come this uh, to 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 overcome this number until twelve thousand. If we think about absenteeism of patients that are not able to uh, to work uh, to to interact with society, and uh, I want to put these numbers for us to understand the importance of a treatment, the importance of uh, some some activity. To, to improve this uh, these uh, problems that we have in the in the medicine and one other concept here is neuromodulation I it's somehow a concept that is new uh, although it's it comes from the um, uh, 1980 uh, we have Patient, we have the, the concept of neuromodulation that it's being more and more talked nowadays with mainly the, the, uh, the sacral neuromodulation with spinal cord modulation. And I want to explain to you what is neuromodulation. And I wanted to use this, this example of a road. Imagine a road full of cars, full of obstacles, and we need to pass to advance in this, this road. And the more and more obstacles we have in this, this road, the more and more difficult would be for us by, by ourselves to overcome these obstacles and to pass this road. And neuromodulation is basically an impulse, an external influence that will give us the possibility to find the path, to find a way to modulate our way through the, the neurons and uh, we'll find a way to, uh, to reach our goal. And uh, we have neuromodulations, a lot of publications nowadays for pain management, for overactive bladder, the sacral neuromodulation, the spinal cord neuromodulation, and uh, neuromodulations in basic science of neuron synapses, uh, way, way deep in the concept. And we get the concept of neuromodulation. We go to the laparoscopic implantation of neuroprothesis, laparoscopic implantation of neuromodulators. And I would like to start in the first chapter where it all began 2002. We go back to Professor Posover doing the first line procedure. 
in a patient with uh, bladder dysfunctions after spinal cord injury. So patients who, uh, a patient who had spinal cord injury, it's not only walking the problem, the problem is way bigger. We have bladder voiding uh, problems, we have rectal voiding uh, problems. And the idea was to get a pacemaker with lead electrodes that already existed for other functions and apply this this these electrodes in the sacral nerve roots in this close to the sciatic nerve for the the parasympathetic and for the 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 nerves that goes to the bladder the nerves that goes to the rectum and pay these patients who have passed through known treatments and didn't work they would uh, be able they would be uh, be patients that could receive the Lyme procedure. And as the first procedure being done in the world, as the first technique, uh, it was a long surgery. It was a minimally invasive surgery, but almost a microsurgery with electrodes being implanted in nerves to put energy. It was very complex. The surgery was, uh, was developed with this LA and N, the LAN technique, the, the neural navigation. And uh, back then, it was the beginning of everything. And one year later, 2003, as the first surgery, well, as the first surgery for bladder function was successful, the patient had improvements on the uh, function of uh, voiding of the bladder. In 2023, the professor uh, developed a further technique to implant electrodes on the femoral nerve that is responsible for extension of the legs and in the sciatic nerve bilaterally in patients in order to bring the electricity to the nerves, to put the electricity down to the leg to make muscle work again. And uh, this technique also, 2003, first, first procedure, uh, it worked. It was incredible, but still something new, still something that had to be developed. And then we come to the chapter two of the neuromodulation is the development of the technique. So since the, the, in the chapter one, we talked about two surgeries, the surgery for the bladder and the rectum and the surgery for locomotion. And these two surgeries were starting to be developed, were starting to be done not only by Professor Posover, but also by other doctors that would go to the professor to, to learn the technique. And studies were, were, starting, were starting to be, to be, to be published. And the, the technique, as every important technique in the science, were needed to be proven. And uh, the study had a lot of good results on spinal cord injury. And it started to be taught the use not only for spinal cord injuries, but for pain, for patients with nerve injuries after surgeries. For patients with chronic pelvic pain, with sexual dysfunction, with uh, bladder and intestinal disorders, but not only because of spinal cord injury, also other dysfunctions that were um, right, that fail other treatments. And the technique started to be developed. The technique was starting uh, to be done by more people, was starting to be published more and more articles. And we have in this point in chapter two, the differentiation between two techniques in the lion umbrella, I, I like to say. So we have the sacral lion procedure where the electrodes were placed in the sacral nerve roots that are mainly for pain, for bladder function, for rectal function, and for sexual function. And the Posover lion procedure, that is the, the, the technique that at this point was for leg movements and locomotion of patients with spinal cord injury. And uh, the development of those two techniques leave us at the point in a chapter two here, we are talking about 2005, 2008, 2010. 2007 was a very interesting year because a lot of studies were published. And at this point, it showed to be a very high, uh, highly effective surgery uh, with autonomic response. Autonomic, I mean the autonomous nerve system that started to show us that was not only 
the locomotion, for example, in the post overline procedure, we start to see more results that will give us more space to move ahead. And the professor started to see a self-control of the body. We are not talking about the procedure that will extend the leg and patients will be able to move with uh, with the abdomen, with um, assisted gait, but patients were starting to have the self-control of their body after the lion procedure. And this is part of the development. And what are the cons? The cons are laparoscopic surgery, expensive off-label technique. And here we start talking about the price. If we start getting a pacemaker with electrodes, it has a high cost. And in an off-label technique where the insurance companies wouldn't pay for the treatment, the patients will have to pay for its own treatment in a technique that is not on label, that is not done for this exact reason. And at this point, we have still a low number of experts that are able to do and are interested in developing this technique. And we continue to chapter three in the development of the sacral lion procedure. And the sacral lion procedure, we have here this, uh, this video that just illustrates, but we have this technique that goes to the sacral nerve roots. I already talked a little bit about the, the, the technique and will stimulate with a low frequency, um, with low frequency impulse, uh, the bladder to do the neuromodulation, not for the impulse, the electric impulse to void the bladder. The electric impulse will teach a new path through the nerves and will remake the system of the bladder to function. And with a, with a low impulse, here we have the, all the, the nerve roots and the electrodes will pass by all of these roots to do the impulse that will go to the bladder and not only, but it will understand how to regain its path. And there is this very interesting article also, not from the professor, but from the first neurosurgeon who started working with laparoscopy and who started studying also the sacral lion procedure. And uh, this is a group from, uh, from Germany that published this, uh, this result in the, the, this study in 2021 from patients that were followed between 2012 and uh, 2019. And uh, those patients had a big improvement in pain. So pain decreased and bladder function increased. And uh, it's important because in science, as I told, we need reproducibility. And here we start to have, we are starting to have more and more publications and more and more people showing that the, 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 the procedure is effective, the procedure works. And we go to chapter four, the post-over line procedure. Recapitulating, I know I'm a little talking over and over about uh, the same things, but it's important because it's a concept that it's not, uh, it's somehow new for everyone. And it's not um, in our uh, in our minds, it's not deep in our minds. So the post-over line procedure, mainly for walking, it was idealized for walking, but Back in the chapter two, we started seeing that it was regaining the function, regaining the autonom the autonomicity of the patients to move their legs, to move their body. And uh, with the four electrodes in the femoral and sciatic nerve, the professor started developing and started understanding that the stimulation that was being done only in the orthodromic, orthodromic I mean, to go the impulse to the leg, to go down in the body. If we started to do a low frequency stimulation, antidromic, I mean, to the head, the, can we just mute? Please? So we don't have an option to mute. Excuse me. Okay. 
Does anyone speak Spanish here? No. Okay. Let's go back. Can you, uh, yeah. And Dr. The, Armando Gomez? Can, can you see the, the presentation? Yes, yes, go ahead. Go Sorry. ahead. Thank you. And uh, we are talking about the antidromic stimulation. So a low frequency stimulation will go back to the neuromodulation and will teach the body, will teach the spinal cord if there is any path to bring the stimulus from the brain to the leg. This is a little light, as the professor uh, likes to say, a little light that is shown in a dark room showing the path. And this changed everything because uh, the Lyon procedure with uh, the neuromodulation on the spinal cord showed with this study published in 2020, uh, a recover of voluntary walking with uh, within patients with a spinal cord injury. And the results of the study, this was the first big study published in a 10 year follow-up of patients and 92% of the patients could extend their legs and 70%, 71% of the patients could perform 10 or more, five or more steps by their own with assistance of crutches or um, of the walker. And uh, this started with more theories. This started with more, uh, with more concepts and we go to the spinal cord, we go to the vagus nerve to regain this pathway from the brain to the leg. And uh, this is the follow-up of the 28 patients that uh, the, the study of the professor showed the results. And 21 to 22, as the chapter four would explain to us and would show us, brought us three independent groups, the group from Zurich, the group from Sao Paulo, and the group from Aros, all of them with similar results from around 70% of the patients in all of those three independent groups could do five or more steps. And if you go to the, to the article published in the, the group of Sao Paulo, uh, we have the patients that could regain this gait further with three months of the surgery. So we have the preparation of the, the, patient, the, the body of the patient to be able to walk again. But three months from the surgery, we could see already results of patients that could uh, regain the gait and regain the, the walking functions. And uh, same results, similar results in, in Denmark that could give us the reproducibility that we need to be able to perform more and more surgeries. But this is not everything. Actually, this is way, way, way far from everything. The spinal cord injury, it's not only about walking. There are lots of uh, problems. There are lots of uh, difficulties. And uh, it's very interesting, the timing of this, of this uh, webinar, in the middle of the Paralympics, we all have the possibility to see uh, athletes that suffer with different conditions, but it's important to put ourselves in their places. The problem is not only to walk. The problem is, for example, a patient who, is sit, who sits every day doesn't have stimulus on the bones, so it will bring an osteoporosis problem, doesn't have stimulus on the muscle, so it will begin with a muscle atrophy. There is a complicated situation that it's called um that is called the the pressure ulcers the the the, the problem with the skin the cubitus ulcers they have a lot of patients have spasticity uh, so spastic paralysis they have spasticity on the legs and way way more other problems and the lion procedure started to to show improvement in much more than walking in the orthodromic stimulation uh, with some, uh, some technique to see the vasodilation of the leg. Uh, Professor Posover could see and could understand that as soon as the stimulus started to go to the legs, all of the parasympathetic fibers of 
the whole inferior member started to function and the blood vessels started to open. And what is that importance? With more blood flow to the muscle and the muscle starting to regain function, it will recover faster. It will gain its function. It will grow faster. With more blood flow to the bone, to the bones, the bone will start to re-mineralize uh, and to regain its uh, density. And to with more blood flow to the skin, the decubitus will go down. If there is a decubitus, it will heal faster. And if there is not a decubitus, it will prevent decubitus lesions. And also in the same time, we started the, the, all of those who were studying the Lyon procedures started seeing that even patients with Asia A, not only Asia B, Asia C, the, those patients could regain the locomotion. And here we come, I will talk about this in the future, but we arrive here in a, 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 a situation that we need to understand. And also other applications, spina bifida, Caudequina, there is a spinal cord injury in the lower part of the spinal cord, multiple sclerosis. We have more and more studies in other applications to do the Lyon procedure. Here, there, are, there is the study of uh, Professor Posover that explains the effects and the processes of the neurostimulation, beginning with low frequency neuromodulation in the three first months. We will have the regeneration of the muscles, of uh, the bones, of the skin, and with an impulse that stays day and night, all the day, all the night, in a very, very low frequency, in a very, very tiny way that it's almost imperceptible, it's painless, we have this preparation for the body to be able to walk again. Here, this other study showing the effects on osteoporosis. Uh, this is the technique I was mentioning of checking as soon as the, the neuromodulation starts, as soon as the pacemaker starts to work, the blood vessel will start to open and the leg will start to begin to, to, to receive uh, blood. And this is not only for the leg. This goes up. We are doing antidromic stimulation. So the antidromic stimulation, the parasympathetic uh, nerve system will go to the vagus nerve. And in during the procedure, we started seeing that the intestines started to working. As soon as the, the pacemaker is turned on, the intestines are starting to be uh, the peristalsis. That means the, the, the bowel movement was starting to, to be faster. And this is par parasympathetic nerve system. And parasympathetic nerve system, the vagus nerve, is also responsible for lung function. The parasympathetic uh, nerve system, the vagus nerve, it goes also to the spleen to regain the white cells count, to regain immunity. And we started seeing the development of all of those uh, techniques. There is a, one patient of the professor that is C2. C2, we are talking about cervical lesion. Two is the second, um, uh, the second bone after the brain. And at first, a patient that was complicated to be operated that, uh, it's difficult to indicate the surgery. The patient was willing to do it. And those higher lesions were beginning to show the more and more effect, the more and more regeneration. Even with lung functions, patients with uh, tracheostomy that could close the tracheostomy and could regain the lung function. And we start to see more and more development of those patients. It's not only walking. And what about the future? What is what do we expect in the future? What do we expect for neuropathology, for neuromodulation? Uh, I sincerely love these three articles that I put on the on the left. Uh, they talk about the future, the present. Uh, humans at the dawn of in-body electrical nerve stimulation era. If you have the chance to go to PubMed to to check the study. It talks about the theories. How does it work? How does uh, what does the vagus nerve has to 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 deal with the locomotion being a nerve that it's theoretically for 
the parasympathetic function, the the autonomous fo- function, and uh, how we can even get to patients that, for example, the Mars mission, to patients that doesn't have contact with the ground and needs to have need to have uh, more bone uh, matter. Where does it well, where does it all go? What will the future hold for us? But now the important part is that we have uh, surgery, we have a technique that is off-label due to technical specificities. And more and more people are starting to gain the attention and we have to teach. We have to open the the Lyme procedure, the neuropelviology, to teach more and more um, surgeons to do this. Neurosurgeons with the robotic surgery, the the access of the Lyme procedure for the neurosurgeons, it's a huge possibility for us. Neuropelviology as a speciality, the continuous education that is already being done by uh, Professor Posover, and patient's knowledge. And to understand how does it how does it go and how to improve this technique even further? And we are talking about neurobodulation. We're talking about uh, those uh, techniques of recovery of functions. And we have this technique that is called genital nerve stimulation. That is also a technique developed by the by Professor Posover. That is also, it doesn't reach, it doesn't uh, go into the line procedure, but it goes to the neuromodulation area uh, era, and it goes to the same idea of uh, recovery of sexual function, bladder function, and rectal function, being the genital nerve, the the dorsal nerve, or the clitoris or the penis, a nerve that goes to the pudendal nerve and goes to the sacral nerve roots into the spinal cord. And it's a technique by gynecologists, very well known. The same technique as a as a as a TVT that we, most of us are very able to do this. And it applies the technique of neuromodulation to the extreme part of the, the, the pudendal nerve, of the, the dorsal nerve of the clitoris to bring back the impulse to give the, uh, to give the neuromodulations and recreate, regenerate the, the path of the nerves. It's a huge pleasure to talk about neuromodulation. It's a huge pleasure to talk about um, the Lyon procedure. And uh, it's a big pleasure to be part of this group, to be part of the the young board, uh, to be a fellow of the professor. I'm really grateful for everything that the professor is teaching me. And uh, for the possibility to board this this mission and to, to develop even more, uh, the technique of the Lyme procedure, the technique of neuromodulation, and the future. What we'll have to treat chronic pelvic pain, what we'll have to treat uh, bladder dysfunction, rectal dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, and patient with spinal cord injuries. Uh, thank you very much. And let's open to questions. Let's open to discussions. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Enrico, because I know it was really not an easy lecture to talk about the lion procedure. It's really difficult. It's even difficult for the gynecologist because it's not a field of gynecology. It's completely different, but it's not easy for neurosurgeons as well who are dealing with spinal cord injury because neurosurgeons are not trained in laparoscopy. So probably you had the most difficult lecture from the, the whole uh, webinar program. And thank you very much because you made it in a, in a great way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for all the support. That was really, really good, Enrica. It's, it's always, uh, it's, you always present them. Your presentations are very nice. So it's super, really nice to hear uh, your talk today. Maybe a quick question from me. You know, when we're talking about Asian classification and to Prof as well, when, when we have Asian classifications of patients with spinal cord injuries, how many of those patients do you think that were originally misdiagnosed that were then reoperated? That maybe explain a little bit on the process how, how those patients get seen, examined, and then classified as 
you know, level four, for example. So explain to us maybe how the how that works a bit. Do you want Eric Enrique? Yeah. Or, or you can do it, Prof, as well. I think it is the lecture from Enrique. Okay. Try. Uh so Spinal cord injury, we usually have an accident. There are some other uh, possibilities of a spinal cord injuries, but usually we're talking about an accident. And this accident will create a damage to the spinal cord. And the first phase, the acute phase of this damage, uh, will be somehow the depending, of course, the the on the, the gravity of the, the lesion, will be somehow same for everyone so we need to wait at least six months to understand what's really going on this phase it's there is a treatment that can be done that it's being tested that is with stem cells but before six months there's not not much to be done in the spinal cord injury after six months we'll start to understand and usually neurosurgeons will do this evaluation of the patients with dermatomes from the head to the leg and functionality of the nerve. So uh, medicine is way, way well developed in this in this area of neurology. We understand what does every every nerve do, and how does where does it arrive. So the the neurosurgeon will do an assessment of all the skin and motoric functions on the patient to understand where does it work, where does it not work, and with this information of the whole body. Uh, it's the, the the image that I showed in the um, in my presentation. The 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 information that the body gives us, the functionality of the body gives us, will give us the classification of Asia A or everything lower of the lesion doesn't well, nothing works. Asia B, we have some sensoric functions, but the sensoric functions we have the dermatomes. We talked about dermatomes already in the. Uh, in other lectures, uh, the dermatomes, not all of the dermatomes work. It's a, somehow a mosaic that we call it. like some parts of the dermatomes will work, some parts will not work. And Asia C, we have a better sensoric function, but we don't have a motoric function in some parts. I mean, for example, a, a thoracic lesion, we have uh the the truncus the 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 abdomen for example that part can work part cannot work we have the tones we have the the ability to stand up to 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 hold our body and all this assessment will give us this uh letter the asia classification uh for us to understand what's going on and we saw i've seen a lot of discussions uh also it's something that uh i, I talk a lot with the professor an asia a, is it really an asia a? is the patient diagnosed with an asia a six months after the lesion will it recover will it regain function what is it uh what is it that it's the real diagnosis so we saw a lot of uh experts Talking that Asia A are, I think, 70%. What's the number for uh, professor? Yeah, it's more or less of 80% of the what we call Asia A complete, which are, in fact, incomplete. They are not Asia A. So that, there is this uh, this concept that the closer to the lesion, the closer to the accident, the less it will function. So the classification may change. Theoretically, it's not to change, but it may change uh, along the way. Maybe to explain a little bit what happened after an accident. When you have an accident, you will get a surgery, you will go on the intensive care. Maybe everybody will be happy that you are not uh, dead. And the problem is that uh, is exactly what uh, um, Henrik mentioned. All paraplegic or tetraplegic or spinal cord injury patient will first develop what we call a shock phase. So even if you have just a small, a very, very small damage to the spinal cord and in the future, you will be able to walk again. The first three, four, six months, usually paraplegic are not able to do anything. Everything is sleepy. The spinal cord, all the nerve, everything is sleepy. And that is a problem because during this first stage, 
most uh, also in, in rehabilitation or in neurosurgical unit, usually they are already starting to try to make a classification for the patient. And once you get a classification A, everybody will try to push you to accept your A, your complete, forget every kind of hope. No way to be able to work again in the future. And that is a problem because when you have paraplegic sitting in a wheelchair for, for months or years without trying to recover, without doing rehabilitation, nothing will come back. So if I am sitting now for the coming three, four months in a wheelchair and it's not allowed for, move, for me to move anything, I will be not able to, 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 to stand and to walk in, uh, anymore. Just the training will induce some change in my brain in the spinal cord and will activate it some fibers. So actually, when we say we're 70% of our patients able to walk more than 10 meters, that means we have some of them able even to walk kilometers. So the main question is, when they are able to walk, they were really complete or they were not complete. And that makes a big, big difference because if the patient was incomplete and you will have just to reactivated some nerve in or the part of the spinal cord. Um, that is, in fact, what we can say, training. But when a patient is complete, according with the current belief in neurosurgery, once you have a complete injury of the spinal cord, it's, it's forever. You will be not able to move anything. And that is exactly what we see in our study. We have more or less than 150 patients now. We perform the line procedure. Some of them, Everybody said before, they are complete, complete, complete. And they become able to stay up and to make some step. So we have to change our, our, our mind. Your paraplegic is for the rest of the life. And if I consider the, the lecture from, uh, from, um, from, um, from Enrique, I would say in neuropelviology, neuropelviology is an evolution. It's like for 30 years, we perform endometrial surgery by open surgery. Then we move to the laparoscopy. Then now we are moving to the robotic. It's not a revolution in medicine. It's an evolution. While in neuropelviology, in my opinion, there are two revolutions. One is the capability of a make a diagnosis because neurologists are not doing making diagnosis on the pelvic nerve and gynecologists uh, uh, are not doing that either. And the second uh, revolution probably we'll see in the future, but is the lion procedure. Because that has never been done before. I, I completely agree. <clears throat> I mean, I think an, anyone that knows you, Professor, when you when whenever we watch your videos or see those patients in live, it is it is incredible to see uh, what can be done <clears throat> surgically to help those patients. Uh, I, I remember the first time I've seen your presentation when I was, a, uh, I think, first year resident. Um, yeah, it's changed. It's changed the way I practice. Uh, and it was definitely something to look into. Um, so thank, thank you for that. Should we move to <clears throat> a couple of questions? There's a good question from Marcella from Colombia. And Marcella is... First of all, she apologized that she had to leave to go to work, but she was asking if there is any proposal to create any healthcare policies in our native countries to benefit patients uh, that might need help with neuropelviology. So she's asking again about proposal for healthcare policies. That's the, the point of everything that we have been doing at the, that's that's our goal that's uh, one uh, part of the the slide of uh, the future uh, it's what we are trying to do we are trying with the young board with the professor with the society or in the, the international society of neuropaviology uh, our goal is to make neuropaviology a, um, a subject uh, like gynecology like um, uh, like uh, urology, like neurosurgery, neuropaviology. And uh, the more regulated it is, the more we can we can work with uh, healthcare, with government, uh, with to, to make the Lyme procedure, uh, for example, a non-label use uh, method, uh, to make all of those other techniques uh, something 
with parameters in the in the medicine like we have for example a hysterectomy very well established today that's our goal to to transform to to bring we have already systematized in neuropaviology but to bring this in a, in a very uh i would say healthy way with uh, the the society but to bring to each country in a way that we have uh uh, homogeneous care for for patients and for and for the healthcare. Mm. That's a re really good answer. Um, I think generally those changes are coming. They just as everything else in medicine, it takes time and it's an evolving change. Uh, I think I can give you an example from England, although it's not specifically with the whole aspect of neuroprobiology, but <clears throat> when it comes to, for example, endometriosis of the pelvic nerves. This has already been taken into consideration and there are certain centers that would be offering this type of treatment, uh, selective centers uh, nationally, but this change is coming very slowly. And I think our goal should be to get uh, the Lyon procedure and nerve stimulation into the NICE guidelines, for example, in order to push it better. But We've looked into it, and it really is a lot of work that needs to be uh, that needs to be done. Yeah, but I think with more information from the patients, even the 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 patients are demanding that we are being trained in this kind of thing, and they are demanding for better solutions for their pain. So I think we're going in a good path. It's going to take a while, but we'll get there. Perfect. Professor, is there anything that you would want to add on that on that subject? Uh, the, the problem is um, the problem in the Lyon procedure is not just depending from our, from our job, from our publication. It's also depending from uh, from the company who are, who are selling the pacemaker, and actually the pacemaker on, for this indication of level use. And mm -hmm. I think we have we have to try to convince the company uh, to make study with us and to, to become the own label on the pacemaker. That is the only way. Until it will be off-label use, it will be, be very, very, very difficult for the insurance to accept uh, the payment of this procedure or reimbursement from this procedure. But I think we're, going, we're coming in the good direction. We will see. Yes. So there's a lot of messages saying how good your presentation was, Enrica. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. There was a question about uh, what is the next step in getting health insurance to pay for neuroprosthesis? So you've just kind of answered it, that it's it's very difficult. Uh, and the biggest problem is actually the of license use. But hopefully there's going to be some changes there, Professor, right? With smaller devices eventually, yes? No, no, but not not just as or maybe I think I will not. Yeah, so Enrique, maybe you have to explain a, a little bit what you plan to do. The, 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 the goal is to to bring neuropathology to open the 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 goal. The, what I what I explain in the future, the idea of us. That's why I'm doing my PhD on neuropathology on Lyon procedure. Uh, it's a technique that is well established, but we need some things for it to be to move ahead. And uh, one of the things, for example, is the 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 the, the pacemaker. There are more than one uh, companies that works, but one of the companies, for example, they have a robotic system that would help us to bring the neurosurgeons to work with us and to be able to embark this journey of the laparoscopy, the, the minimal invasive uh, surgery in the pelvis that usually theoretically they are not trained and to be the ones who will uh, help us to, to move ahead and the ones who are theoretically in charge of spinal cord injury. That's one point. Second point is to make People interested, and uh, it's our one also one of the, the 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 papers we are we are doing in the PhD. It's to show gynecologists, to show urologists, to show other pelvic surgeon, expert pelvic surgeons that are already ready to do this procedure, 
that they can be taught not in a long way. The procedure is reproducible. So we are doing a work in, uh, in Barcelona that will put the, the, the that will see how, PS, how um, expert surgeons in three days of training would perform in a surgery in a model, not a living person, not, a, not, not in persons that we are doing this study, of course, but we are doing the surgery in a model to check, to assess in three days course in a person that has more than 100 laparoscopic surgeries in their curriculum, how will they do the Lyon procedure if it's reproducible? This is step number two. Step number three, to make neuropathology a university um, uh, subject, subject, like speciality. Uh, a speciality. So uh, the goal, going coming back from uh, to São Paulo, is to develop neuropathology not necessarily not necessarily not, not under gynecology not under uh coloproctology not under urology but as its own subject as for example we see uh, for example in brazil mastology the 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 um, breast medicine you can become a breast uh, doctor by general surgery you can become a breast doctor by uh gynecology so the idea is for an neuropathologist to be a specialty that you can come from gynecology, yes, you can come from neurosurgery, you can come from urology, you can come from, from any surgical uh, specialty. That's step number four. Did you forgot any step? No, <laughs> I think, I think to, to promote the Lyon procedure, I think there are two messages. The problem, like a lot of things, um, when there when there is an evolution, this evolution has first to go away. So the lion procedure have been found in Europe. I think the lion procedure have to be uh, to left Europe to go to US and to South America and maybe to come back. It was exactly the way for laparoscopy. It's the way for the robotic surgery. It is how it is. The second thing, I made a big, big mistake because I'm talking about the lion paraplegic since more than 15 years in gynecology, but gynecology is not, not willing to start with a lion procedure in paraplegic, even more because most of the patients are men and not women. And now something is changing because more and more neurosurgeons are becoming aware on the lion procedure and want to learn the lion procedure. And Enrique mentioned something very, very important. We need years of training to learn, to be able to do laparoscopy. But there is a new tool when we can learn much faster to do endoscopic surgery is a robotic surgery. And we have not to forget that neurosurgeons are endoscopic surgeons. And the way is probably to bring robotic surgery to the neurosurgeon and then to implement the Lyon procedure, though not laparoscopic uh, implantation, but probably robotic implantation, but in the field of neuropelvial, uh, no, film on neurosurgery. Perfect. And speaking about neurosurgeons, I can I can see that we actually have a neurosurgeon present here with us. Uh, I don't want to put Pedro on the spot, but I, um, I think this is my other father-in-law or my brother-in-law that has joined us today. They're both neurosurgeons. Uh, there he is, Pedro. Hi. Hello, so, how are you? Thank you for joining us, Pedro. Yes, it's good to see you. So, Pedro, Very interesting. It was in, Pedro is a new, new, neurosurgeon in Barcelona. <clears throat> he does um, deep brain stimulation, and he's been quite interested in, in neuropalveology and Enrique is doing his PhD from Barcelona. So he's doing a PhD from your hospital, essentially, Pedro. Okay. So what we need to do is actually create bigger bonds and, and, and start doing much more research together. Yeah, that's true. That's something that we've been speaking about a um, long time ago, and it is very interesting. It is a field that, you know, it's becoming every day more a hot topic. As you know, there's been a lot of the advances in, in, in neurostimulation, spinal cord stimulation for paraplegic and post-traumatic lesions of the spinal cord. So 
will be speaking about this. I would like and love to to coordinate more studies together. Yeah, so Thank we you, are but, here to work. But you you could be part of the of the PhD study from Enrique in Barcelona because of course. that's exactly what we were talking. It would be nice to have neurosurgeon on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been we've been speaking about this a long time ago. So I'm fascinated with the idea. I think I think every holiday that we 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 end up discussing neuropolbiology of a cold beer. Yeah, 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 yeah. One or two as much. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you you mentioned something very important. You said spinal cord injury, one uh, spinal cord stimulation. One of the main difference between your work from Courtin with the spinal yeah. cord stimulation and the Lyon procedure is that. When you do stimulation of the lower motor neuron, you have the vegetative nerve system in the field of neuromodulation that you don't have in spinal cord stimulation. And that make a big, a huge difference. Okay, but for positive or for negative, you mean it's a huge difference because to, to, to good or to bad? The good, because obviously, you know, as of now I go a little bit in the technical uh, aspect, but when I, I start with the Lyon procedure, you bring electrode on the sciatic nerve and the femoral nerve. And within the sacral nerve root, the sciatic nerve, you have sympathetic fibers. And I was afraid that if I put electricity on the nerve, I will stimulate the sympathetic nerve and use a vasoconstriction. Uh -huh, and what we yeah. observe is exactly the contrary. When you bring low frequency antidromic stimulation, you will induce uh, activation of the parasympathetic nerve system and obviously not the pelvic parasympathetic nerve system, the sacral plexus, but the vagus nerves. So obviously yeah. there are some neuro, neuroanastomosis between the sacral plexus, the lumbosacral plexus and the vagus nerve. And that is the mystery, the main mystery uh, of, the, yeah. of the procedure. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. But it would be nice to have uh, time to, sp to speak together in Barcelona. Uh, I think, Enrique, your PhD, your study will be in December at yeah. the University of Barcelona, right? The end of the summer. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm professor in the university, so it's even uh, more useful. So we can keep in touch with with uh, Dr. Laranchik uh, and, and and contact if you want to. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thanks for joining us. <clears throat> hope you hope you enjoyed it. And it really sort of brings us up to to six o'clock, five o'clock UK time. So it's almost time to to end the webinar. Do you guys have any any other questions? Does anyone want to mention anything else? I'm excited. <laughs> Me as well. I would like to say one thing. I would like to say it's not over. We end this series of webinars, but next month we'll come back with another series of webinars. We'll reconstruct, we will uh, recreate to make more interesting, to make uh, more, um, uh, more, to bring more information in a different way for you and uh, for patients, for, uh, for people who are, who are interested in, uh, in neuropaviology. But at that point, if patient has some uh, advice or some proposition, what we could do, we are open for everything. The only thing we would not do is to make a, a, a consultation online. We cannot treat the single case from a patient that we cannot do even because of uh, of the law. But if patient has some uh, some advice, what we could do better. That would be a, a good idea to send us some mail and to, and we can sing in the board together. Just one information by, by the way, um, I sign already the contract, the next uh, ISON Congress, International Congress, will take 25, uh, to 2025 in end of May in Istanbul. Okay. Amazing. Is fixed. We will get all of you. You will get a uh, invitation, and we'll uh, bring the program everything on the uh, on the uh, homepage of the Horizon. And very very interesting. It will be with live surgery, with live de dissection on cadaver, and live diagnosis demonstration. Perfect. Everything will be there. <clears throat>
Okay. And the only good guy, okay. I have to thank all of you from the young born. You you did really a great job, all of you. I'm so proud, I'm so thankful for your for your help for promoting uh, promoting the neuropalveology. Thank you. And once again, congratulations, uh, uh, Henrika, for your great lecture from today. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.